and welcome to Fat Squirrel Speaks. Today is Thursday, October 26th, and I'm Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. And as I say that, I realize I'm not really posting very much there, but I am still lurking. So I'm enjoying seeing all of your posts and sharing in the joy of your making. Um, I just, the internet has enough of me. Like it doesn't need my voice anymore. <laughs> this is enough. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thanks for coming over. Thanks for hanging out. Um, thank you for being patient as the lighting is very temperamental today. I'm trying to see I'm not wearing my specs. I feel very naked. It's interesting how like, again, I feel very vulnerable because I don't have my eyes, my glasses on, but they were just like being too temperamental with glare and whatnot. So I can still see you. I just can't see your car that's on the street. <laughs> so this episode is going to take contain some shenanigans. It's going to contain some stitching. It's going to contain some knitting. Um, but first off, it's going to contain some like important date information. Uh, so just popping in to let you know, I forgot to mention that there are a few of these rabbit bags in the shop right now. So these are the denim from Spoonflower. It's this great sort of like visual linen texture, but it is the denim fabric um, and this great block work print. So those are in the shop, fatsquirrelfibers.com. I had a little bit of a sneaky update, which I didn't tell anybody about because that's always a really great business decision. But, you know, bandwidth, y'all, bandwidth. So thanks. Um, so fatsquirrelfibers.com. I'm going to have an update November 1st. I am not going to do the preview here because it's actually quite a bit. Uh, there's quite a few designs that I'm really excited about that it will be, so it'll be November 1st. Don't get ahead of yourself, Beth. November 1st, 9 p.m. Eastern, fatsquirrelfibers.com. And it will be my Christmas slash Yule update. There is actually a Yule bag. It has the um, the Yule goat. Is that what she's called? Like the little straw goat. It, the bag has that. It has like um, some sort of like witchy elements. Oh my gosh! Did you see all? Do you watch? Do you listen to ologies? There was a witchology. Um, anyway, so it will have. So there's one. I wish I had gotten more of it, but by the time I got it in and realized like how much I enjoyed it, I had so many other bags to sew that I was like, oh, I don't think I can like work any more of these into the schedule. And also, I don't know how many of you would actually be interested in. Um, but it's really cute. But anyway, so there's lots of like Christmassy, Yuli bags um, that'll be in the shop November 1st. And I will do a YouTube preview, um, probably like the day before. Um, to show you all the bags because uh, there are so many fun designs and yeah that'll, I think that'll give us a better way to deal with the number of different fabrics that I have available for you. So that'll be November 1st. Then hopefully November 15th back update Small Business Saturday. <laughs> so November 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern or Small Business Saturday probably at 9 a.m. We'll just mix it up if I mess up. Um, I will have winter bags. So those will be, um, like things of like winter skating landscapes. There will be like birds in bowels. Uh, basically if it doesn't have like, uh, a nutcracker or <laughs> an ornament or a partridge in a pear tree, uh, but it's wintry, it'll be on November 1st or excuse me, November 15th, back update, small business Saturday. That's where fibers.com. So shenanigans, uh, since we talked last, I was super lucky and I got to go on a little like crafty retreat with some friends where we rented an Airbnb and just hung out for a long weekend. Um, and so wonderful. I'm so, so lucky uh, and so th grateful that I, uh, this job has like landed me some amazing friendships where I get to hang out with people uh, because as a really intense introvert, that probably would have never happened otherwise. <laughs> so thank you. Um, we hung out in sort of like 
uh, land between the lakes i think is what it's called is the area it's an area in kentucky where there's like two really long are they lakes are they rivers i think one of them is called both a lake and a river like in its actual title um so we got there and then we went to paducah because paducah was like an hour away so we were able to go there for like a little day trip thing and one of the reasons we went well actually the primary reason we went is because paducah has the has a quilt museum i started to say then i don't think it's called the national quilt museum but it's like recognized as the national quilt museum which is weird that that's like a thing that they have to apply for yearly i don't understand but neither here nor there uh it's a quilt museum and I was expecting, I don't know, I didn't, I looked at their website, but I didn't really like dig deep or anything. I was expecting there to be like a lot of historical quilts, like, you know, Mary Alice Sitchis in 1874 or whatever, um, or at least some, but there weren't. It was all modern quilt makers. So it was really awesome and exciting and inspiring and all those things but it was not exactly what I expected. Um, that said, it was really nice for just like a short trip. It was not as big as I expected. Um, it was sort of just like a large gallery space. Um, but, and they do have like traveling or ex they have different expositions. So this, when we were there, they had um, an exposition that was all about, it was centered around wind. So there were lots of different interpretations of that theme. So that was super interesting. There were a lot of different techniques, a lot of, I, I love quilt making in that there is such a broad range of possibilities. Again, just like most needle arts, right? And there was so many things that were, um, Techniques I don't know that I would want to explore. Like I'm not into creating like pictorial quilts, but they are just amazing to look at, right? They're super inspiring. And um, so that was super interesting. And then they had like a small quilt of the month, like a, like a quilt block sampler. Like there were several that had used the same um, monthly quilt blocks. So that was super fun just to see the differences in, um, color like what the difference in color use what the difference in placement of the blocks what the difference in like um, different edging techniques whether it's binding or like i had never really seen that little like there's like a napkin edge almost like it's like little like corners that stick out from the edging that are i've never seen that used before um so it's not like pineapple quilting but it's like the same shape now that I'm talking about it, I'm like, do I, I know I took pictures of them, but yeah. So this is one example. Um, but it was really, it was pretty wild to see all of the different things uh, that folks, again, you have this, you have limitations of the like the materials and like space and you know and all that but just to see how different people approach it and work within those parameters is always interesting and then there was like a quilts of valor um exhibition and then there was i don't know that the tiny quilts i think those might be a permanent um feature and those were super fun oh my gosh there was a pineapple quilt where the finished squares must have only been like two inch square was insane and then not only so the, but the interesting thing was is like not only did you have this pineapple quilt but like every other square was black and even the black ones were pieced it was pretty bananas in a in a wonderful way in a wonderful way and so then part of that then is they also got to go through i'm like why didn't i take a picture of that not that it would have shown up to show you but whatever but then we also went through town. We didn't look at a ton of places just because, you know, we were, well, again, we just didn't. Uh, but we did get to go to this one shop called, burr, 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 burr. oh, I had their little, there it is. Uh, it was called uh, Tuscan Rose. And they had 
was a really surprising amount of yarn. Uh, I was excited to go because they had specifically said so they had hand dyed fabric and I have this project that I want to show you in a minute um, that I was looking for some stuff for that. Um, but the surprise was that they had a really great yarn selection. I mean, very impressive. They had everything from like Queensland to Noro. They had um, a Jameson and Smith and Jameson's of Shetland. I don't think I have ever, I might be lying. I don't think I have ever seen Jameson's of Shetland in person in a store. Um, so that was like a very wonderful and exciting surprise. Um, and then we went, we tried to go to, there is an English paper piecing pop-up. They call it a pop-up, but it's a permanent store. I don't know if they're calling up. We went during their advertised business hours, but apparently you have to make an appointment to actually shop there. Which when I look back, it does say on the website, but I just saw hours and assumed that, you know, anyway, we did look through the window very intensely. Uh, because I was really like on an English paper piecing, like crafting bubble at the moment, which has now collapsed. That's fine. You know, things ebb and flow. <laughs> uh, so we tried to go there, but that was not successful. Uh, and then we also went to Hancock's of Paducah, which is a huge um, store that's, it's not in town. It's a little bit of a drive. I mean, it's just, it's not necessarily walkable from town is what I guess I'm trying to say. Um, especially if you're gonna buy anything. Uh, but they had a huge quilters cotton selection, like bananas. Uh, just about anything that's currently available, they had it, uh, which was awesome. I didn't, and then they had a really fun back room where they had all of their pre-cuts. So like aisles of fat quarters, aisles of honey buns, aisles of, actually I don't know if they were honey buns, but um, what are those, jelly rolls. Uh, and then like a gabillion quilt kits, which was fun to look at that. I've never seen, you know, it was just like a ton of selection uh, to the point where it was very overwhelming. I think it's definitely a place where you want to go with something in mind or um, like a project in mind to shop because it was just like otherwise. Um, but I did get like a small fat quarter bundle of some wovens, which was exciting. I got that and then I got something else, but I, I got, oh, they had, they had all of the tulip needles, right? Like all of the like beautiful, I, I love the tulip milliners for English paper piecing and also for doing the binding on my quilts. Um, but they had all of those. They had a ton of it's not John Arbor because that's not correct, but it's like a ton of peacemakers needles. They had a ton of that other brand of needle that I can't think of right now. Um, it was just like, that was really, they had a, like a ton of different quilting rulers and templates and stuff like that. Um, so it was just fun. Also, it's just fun to think about Hancock's. Like what is going on with Hancock's? Is Hancock's like the IGA of fabric world? Like, is it, I mean, I could look this up, but let's just talk about things I don't understand because that's what we do. Um, is it like a, is it like a, um, what is that called? Okay, luckily, just the fact that I was typing into the Google, let me remember that it's called a franchise. <laughs> I'm assuming it's something like that because so many of them are gone um, and the ones that still exist feel like they are not in any way related to one another except for the title. Like, I can't remember when I was a kid going to Hancock's I believe there, I think there used to be one in Cherry Grove, if you're a Cincinnati kid. Uh, and then I think that one closed and then there was one further down on Beachmont, like almost, um, well, anyway. And I mean, as a kid, they were, tor that was pure torture, pure torture. <laughs> But you just won't see them anymore. But I know that there's Hancock's of Paducah. And I know I've heard of a couple of others like scattered around. Um, so anyway, but anyway, so it was very fun. Very fun. And yeah, so I have some projects to show you that I bought some stuff there for. Um, but yeah, if you're in the area, like definitely, I would say that it, I mean, there's lots, there are lots of shops. Like the town is very walkable and very cute. It's an old river town. Um, 
and I'm sure there's lots and lots of other treasures there to be explored. We just weren't on that time schedule, but it's a great little day trip if you're in the area. Um, speaking of English paper piecing, I finally finished an English paper pieced project. I've tried several different ones and just not been pleased with like what I have. I think I was really intrigued by the process of it, but not necessarily what I was making, I guess is the best way to say it. So I decided that I would look for a small project. And what I found are, uh, there's a seller on Etsy. She is called Cake and Ale. And she does little like three dimensional English paper piece projects. And I've seen other ones before, like my backdoor quilts in Greenwood, Indiana has some English paper piece, like three dimensional, like a bowl and things like that. But she has a little bit more selection. And so I decided, you know what, on a whim, I was just going to try it out. And so you're supposed to print the pieces, the paper pieces on 250 to 300 gram cardstock, which I had some cardstock, but I'm sure it was not that heavy. Um, and it, I think it definitely would have been better if I had had the heavier stuff, but I just wanted to do something that I had on hand that I was not buying anything special for. And so I did it. And so I created this little bowl and I mean, come on. So this is a Ray Ritchie print. I did this print for Halloween and then inside I have some wovens, but I have this surprise little gal in the middle. How cute is that? So she has lots of different um, shapes. She's got some taller ones, but they're just like little, you know, containers. And so like I have this just up on my bookshelves holding little bits and bobs. Um, things I would do differently. I used 80 weight to do my piecing, um, to like sew my little pieces together. I'd glue based. Uh, I would not, if I were going to do another three dimensional project, I would use regular sewing weight thread because there's a point where this outside one, you have to flip it inside out just the way you sew, you have to flip it inside out and it does put a lot of stress on the seams and it made this, uh, it kind of shows the pull on the, the stitches a little bit more. Is that right? Whatever. But either way, I'm not upset about it. And also like if you wanted to do this, if you just had some cardstock in the house, what I would do, if like if I were gonna do it again and I didn't wanna buy extra cardstock, I would just print um, an extra set of the templates and just put like a third, like when you're joining them together, you could just, and you could just use the glue pin that you used to glue based. You could just like glue an extra piece on there to give it a little bit um, more rigidity because it, it does, nobody would know. But when I'm touching it, like I'm like, oh, there's like a, it's like a little bit like a, like almost like a bubble um, where the, the paper is, it needs a little bit more stability. Um, but yeah, it is really cute though. And I messed up. I meant to have all my little frogs facing each other like these are, but I was putting it together and messed up. So some of them are not together, but like, we'll just pretend they're all like this. Cause that's the cutest, right? And I can't believe, I never thought I would fussy cut something. I was always just like, oh no, because like lots of times when I see people fussy cut stuff, they like have that little template and they put it down exactly over the little creature that they're going to do. And then they use their cutter to cut out around that. And that stresses me out so much. I'm like, that does not look pleasant at all. But what I did was I just like roughly cut out my piece, like, a, like, you know, like a really raggedy square. And then I just glued my template onto it where it needed to be and then just trimmed around. So like that was much easier for my brain to handle. And so I can definitely see me trying to do some more of that in the future um, because like, I'm just going to keep showing them to you because look at these handsome dapper gentlemen. Right. But like, if you look like, if you look on Instagram at English paper piecing, there are some of them that look like full on like mandalas. Like they are so beautiful. And I think, I think if I were going to, I think I can make like one, right? Like I would kind of like to make one and just frame it as its own piece. I would never want to try to make a whole quilt of them. Um, but some of them are fascinating to look at. Like they just, 
because that's just like the perfect little repeating shape. They're super intricate. I love it. Super fun to look at. Um, but yeah, I think I could do what in this method, this like much messier, much less precise method of just rough cutting the little image that you want, pasting your English paper piece onto it, and then, you know, basting it from there, like doing the, and then cutting around it and then, you know, basting it or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think I could do that, but it's really cute. Speaking of English paper piecing, so I told you I went to, um, Tuscan Rose with the hopes of finding some things. I have this pat this pattern. So this is called the Barn Owl, an English paper piecing project by I put it in the envelope backwards so it's covered up. Violet Craft. And there are several different creatures. I know there's like a lion and I don't, there's several different creatures, but I thought this is perfect, right? This is an amount of English paper piecing that I can do. It's it's finite, and then like I'm done, and it's just like a wall hanging or something, which I'm pretty jazzed about. But isn't he so cute? But I also knew that I did not really want this rainbow behind him because even though I love the way it looks, I mean I think it's I appreciate the way it looks. I just didn't want that for mine, and so I was playing with. I had some wovens. I didn't have a ton of blues, and I was like trying to look at the blues. I wasn't really excited about them. I had, I even went so far as to purchase like a little charm pack, which are like five inch squares of Kona cotton in blues that I then tried to like tea dye over to like give me more variety for the background. But I just wasn't loving how they looked. And so I wanted to go there to see if I could find some backgrounds. And I did, I think. Well, I did. So I found this little palette of fat quarters. I think I added one to an existing palette um, to get some more scummies. So don't you, I think these will work for the backgrounds. And even though they're solids, they do have like a hand dyed texture, which I really, really dig. Right? So I think that'll be fun. What do you think? We'll see. So I bought these guys. Let me show you even the darker ones. If this is the very darkest one, but it still has. I'm like, but like not so much texture as like a batik, right? Because like that was the other thing I thought. Well, um, backdoor quilts were it, that's very close to me has a lot of batik fabrics, and I thought, well, maybe I could do that, and I think that would still work because the size of the pieces is small enough. I think you could still get just like a texture versus like a shape. Um, but I think this will work well. I think batiks would also work, but I think it would just take a little bit more hunting. And so I did that. And then I also, with my craft of friends, I did some ice dyeing in similar hues to try to get some additional fabrics to put in there. So, um, right. So this is just Kona. You can get it from Joann's. It's Kona cotton. Uh, you can get it that's prepared for dye. So it's called PFD. And they even sell that, that version in stores. And I did not wash this beforehand, right? Because I was like, it's prepared for dye. I'm not going to read up on it. I'm just going to use it. <laughs> and it seems like it worked out fine. <laughs> so I just did some ice dyeing. There's lots of tutorials that you can find on YouTube. Um, I bought these dyes um several years a couple of years ago from dharma um because my kiddo and i were going to do some ice dyeing we did some ice dyeing on some t-shirts um but then i was like oh somebody suggested doing tie dyeing as part of the retreat and i was like oh that's a great excuse for me to do this and get some additional fabrics for this project Right? So don't you think those will work well with those those um, dyed fat quarters that I got? I think it's going to work really well. I'm just going to keep holding weird things up to you. Because this is, let me show you this. Oh, it's over here. This is the size of the background little um, shape. Right? So like, I think that'll be really good. 
So there's still enough that you can get mostly like a solid or maybe just like a little bit of variety. Need some like fun scummy greens through here. Yeah, we'll see. Right, because the thing about like quilting or English paper piecing or like all that is like it's a whole different set of um, stash. And like I'm really trying not to have I'm trying not to be overwhelmed by my stash, right? Like I'm not in any way, like the, I'm not like, oh, there is a specific amount of stash that is reasonable. Like that's not what I believe at all. I believe that it is a hundred percent up to the individual. Um, and you could have five times more stuff than I do. And I would have no cares for that. It was, that was as long as you felt good about it. That's all I would care about. Um, but I'm just at a point right now where I'm feeling like I am overwhelmed by it. And so I need to figure out ways to deal with that. And one of the ways is to not buy a ton of different stuff for a new project, which is what my natural tendency is, um, is to go buy everything I might possibly need for a project. Do you do this? Do you get in like such a loop? Do you have, okay. I will get like in a very brain obsessed loop about something that I want to make or like something that I envision. And it feels like the only way to exercise myself out of that loop is to buy the stuff or like, or like go pick from stash. Like that's also, that works in this situation. Um, but like, I, I it cannot be freed from it unless I like somehow exercise it into a possibility. It, Unfortunately, it doesn't mean I have to make it. it. Just means I have to have its potential within my reach. Do you do this? It doesn't have to be about crafting, be about anything. But like, how do you get out of that? Like, is there, have you, do you have a technique? Do you have like a, a, a special thing that you've trained yourself to do? Because it almost feels like debilitating. Like when I am in one of these like, loops I again it feels like it's like a wound it's like a festering wound and the only way that I can relieve myself of the pain of this festering wound is to like like medievally like excise it from my body <laughs> the way to do that is to like again create the potential for this thing to exist Ugh. I mean, I'm really glad that I'm in a place where I can at least recognize that that's what's happening. So I think that's helpful um, in moving through it. Hopefully I can remember like while it's happening. Um, but sometimes I do remember while it's happening that this is just like a thing my brain is doing to me um, and I still don't know how to move out of it. Do you, have do you have tips? Do you have tricks? Do you share this? Do you share this <laughs> ridiculous thing? <laughs> Like the other day, I was literally in the middle. I was in a fairly good groove sewing uh, bags. And like, it just hit me that I absolutely must. I had to stop everything I was doing and do a foundation paper pieced pineapple block. Because potentially that's my, I might want to do with a set of fat quarters that I have for a Christmas quilt. And so I took like an hour out of my day to just like, okay, I, I only had to spend $1.37 for the template, luckily. Um, I had to download the template and like cut out my strips and like, look at a video about how to do it. And like, I didn't even, I didn't even have to finish it. I just was able to like move through like three quarters of it and then be like, no, that is not what I want. And then it was like, again, it was like I had lanced the boil and it was painful, but it was done and I could like then move on. And like that one's fine, right? Like it's annoying, but it's fine. I didn't spend a bunch of money. I mean, it is annoying because I then like messed up a bunch of stuff to try to get strips that, you know what I mean? Like it did like, whatever. It was annoying, but it was not terrible. Uh, I didn't bring anything else into my house to do it. <laughs> oh my gosh. But for real, y'all. For real. I think this is 
why I went through a period in my adult life where I did not create anything it was like, it was just like, I could not, I could not put myself in that, what is that little boat that this, that like many different ancient cultures have used? Car caracol? It's just like this little, like, it looks like half of a melon that just got bigger. And then it's like a wood frame with like some waxed fabric on it or some sort of way to make it waterproof. And they're like, they're very hard to steer, but you're like, I just feel like I was like, I was on the shore and I was like, I'm not getting into that boat because I know that I will not be able to control it. So it is better for me just to not even get near this water rather than to be, to succumb to the, its will. Like, right. So I don't know how to, like, can't, I still can't steer the boat. It's been 20 years and I'm still having trouble steering this boat. Oh, do you have trips? Do you have tip, tips, tricks of steering the boat? Oh my goodness. Overall, I'm doing okay, right? Overall, it's fine. <laughs> but these eddies, these like little whirlpools that I get stuck in and I'm just like, <laughs> use my little paddle so hard. And the whirlpool's just like, no. No, and it's only like the creation of a whirlpool over here that somehow pulls me out of this whirlpool and maybe I'm able to avoid that one and I can go downstream a little bit. But sometimes I just get stuck into that one too. Clean <laughs> dice dive. It was actually one of the things the teen said when they left for college was like, um, <laughs> was like, I know it, we were just talking about random stuff and it, and it was like, yeah, the problem is going to be when I need to do a random craft and it's not instantly at my fingertips because my mother is an insane woman who, you know, randomly has jewelry findings that I'm going to need on, at like two o'clock on a Tuesday. And I was like, I feel you bra. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I need to live in a crafty commune. I mean, the universe is telling me over and over that that's what I need to do with my life. And yet this is yet another reason I need to live in a crafty commune because I could just be in the eddy in my caracol. I love that I'm just keep using a word I don't even know is a word. I'm just going to keep going with it. Um, I'm just going <laughs> to... How many of you stopped the video? to randomly research what this thing is that I was talking about. Cause that would have been me. I'm just giving you a little gift. If I were the woman from Ologies, I would have put a little thing in here that tells you all about caracals. Cause she's brilliant. Brilliant. Oh my gosh, did you listen? There's Palmology. My lovely Canadian, Canadian, my lovely Canadian Linda uh, sent me like, hey, heads up. Do you know that there's a Palmology? So there's a, there's an Ologies that's all about apples. Um, what was I oh, so I need to live in the crafty commune so that we can just be, I could be like, oh, I'm in this eddy. But luckily Edith was in this eddy six months ago and she did buy all the tools I need to, to carve a spoon. Thanks, Edith. Thanks. Like we could just all have our like primary niches, right? Like I would know I need to go to Edith for woodworking items. I would know that I needed to, to go to, um, I, no, I don't even know names. I need, would know I needed to go to Hobbit Hole 37 to access uh, beeswax and all of the related beeswax crafts. Just saying. Oh my gosh. Now in my head, we have tiny Hobbit houses in our crafting commune. And let me just discuss, it's the best place ever. Right, tiny houses, but make them Hobbit. Unless you don't want a Hobbit house, that's fine too. Um, but there will be a Hobbit neighborhood. Uh, oh gosh, how do we even recover? How do we even recover from the 
Hobbit crafting commune. Okay, so so yes, yeah, so I did all that dyeing and fabric and purchasing of fabric in the hopes that I could make this little guy. Um, while I was on my weekend, I did take some time to um, glue baste the pieces of the owl. They're all these like crazy wackadoodle shapes, right? So what this kit is, is it's actually, it gives you like just paper punch outs of all of your templates. And it's actually super cleverly done because each shape has, um, like each template has a shape and a number. So you know that for example, all the cherries are gonna need this level of, of darkness because they give you this little key that tells you like these are the values that these fabrics should have for the owl itself. And then everything else is just up to you. Um, but yeah, how cute is that? Isn't that clever? So I'm very impressed with how that was done. We'll see how I do on all these like crazy pieces, but I am excited. So I was able to use um, wovens that my mom gave me last year for Christmas. She gave me like an entire picnic basket of wovens because I'm the luckiest. Um, so I had all these great uh, grayy, blacky, wonderful hues to choose from. You know, right? So I have all these guys. And, and then these are all my background pieces that I have not done yet because I need to figure out my fabrics. But I hope, I'm hoping to work on that soon because like it'll be fun, right? And you don't even have to frame them. You can just like bind them like a little quilt and then tack them up on the wall. Love it. So I got the pattern locally at Crimson Tate and she is like my closest local quilt shop. Uh, and it's fun to have both uh, back door, which has a more traditional um, sort of feel, and then Crimson Tate, which is definitely a modern quilt shop. Uh, it's, it's so fun to be able to have access to both of those within a very short driving distance. Um, and Crimson Tate's even bikeable. And it's across from a cutie cutie bookstore and a food hall, which is basically like a food court for grown-ups. Indianapolis is not the greatest, but uh, I can afford to live here. And there's cute things like that, which are really great. Okay, so that is like quilty stitching. And then in stitchy stitching, I finished um, this pattern. It's called Quaker Crow and it's by The Work Basket. Mary Olson and Candy Scott 2016. So I finished my stitching. This is the first time I've ever used silk. And I think we talked about last week, I should have just used it. The pattern suggests using just one strand of silk, but I used two because I'm crazy. There were reasons. Um, but if I'm going to do it again, I would definitely just use one strand. But isn't he pretty? And you can see there's totally an error right here where um, I was trying out a different way of stitching. Like when you use hand dyed um, silks or flosses or whatever, you lots of times just want to do one complete stitch at a time instead of like railroad where you do like a whole row and then come back. Um, but I was having a little trouble figuring out like the best way to not be wasting thread while I was doing that. And so I experimented with like just doing a square at a time. Um, but then that really looked like a square when I, <laughs> when I got further down. So then I tried to go back and pick it out, but like I just could not pick it out. I don't know if it's probably because of just doing one stitch at a time. It's a lot, it's a lot different to pick out than it is when you're doing railroad. Um, but so it, but, but overall, it's just a little bit wonky right there in his head. And then there's a little bit of wonkiness in this star I messed up. So I'm trying to decide at this point if he should go in my yard sale because I really liked stitching it and I think I would like to stitch another one. Um, and I might do that. I might just send him off to another happy person who could have him and then create another one because I really did enjoy making it. Um, and that is the called for. So it's Weeks Dye Works 35 count linen in straw and then Belle de Soie silk in charcoal. That's fun. 
So she's a, and then, um, again, whether I keep this one or make another one, I will, originally I thought I would frame it, but I think I might do this stand up thing where you make like basically a pillow that stands up on its own. Um, I might try to do that just because it is a smaller little guy. I don't know, we'll decide. I also think it would be super cute in just like a matte black frame, like a simple, like I kind of want it to look like a Ginny Lind bed or something like, like little, I want like little balls. Now I'm all like, maybe I could just make one. Maybe I could just dye some like wooden craft balls and oh my gosh, what is wrong with me? <laughs> But anyway, so that's finished. And then I also worked quite a bit on my twall rooster. I finished the roostering. What? I did y'all. Again, 20 plus year old whip. I'm, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. So I have no idea what this fabric is. I'm assuming it's like Zweigert or something that I could have bought like at a Joanne. I mean, it's definitely something I could have bought like at a Joanne's or a Michael's. Um, I believe it is 32 count and I'm just using black DMC two strands over two. Um, but yeah, right. How fun. I'm making progress. So yeah, I finished his giant rooster tail. And so I'm working on the ground right now. And then I have the, like, there's twally bits, like letters, sampleriness over here. That's so yes. Ah! How fun. So I am really enjoying the stitching and I'm enjoying to hear so many of you talk about how much you're enjoying the stitching. And if you're not enjoying the stitching because you can't see it, I'm so sorry. That sucks. Um, you know, the only, th I, I was having a similar problem. I'm not saying it, it was your problem. I was having a, a similar problem in that I was having a lot of trouble seeing, um, my work. And so what worked for me ultimately is I bought this like little $35 Ikea light <coughs> excuse me <coughs> this little uh it's like an led light and they have it like both in a base like in a there's a version that you can just like sit on a table and then there's a version i think that has like a pinch clamp and then there's a version that has like a clamp that you can um tighten down by hand and so ultimately that's the last version is the version i got and it's really nice because you can either orient it you can orient it two different directions so in this case, what I did was I or I put it on a bookshelf that's behind the chair I stitch in. And so it's like a very concentrated, bright light, mostly on what I'm working on. And it's like all goosenecky in that it's like flexible and stuff. So you can really like hone it in on what you're working on. I also have like a desk lamp that is like a ring light with a magnification. Like I think it's five times. Um, and that does work for me, like, but I just don't enjoy using it as much. Um, so it requires me to sit in a different place. It also um, has a tendency to make me feel a little bit car sick <laughs> because I'm sure it's because my eyes are constantly focusing on the magnification versus the non-magnification. And you kind of have to hold your stitching in a place that is the focused area, like the focal length is specific. It doesn't like adjust like a, a camera would or what have you. Um, so, cause I stitch in hand, like you can see, I don't use a hoop. Um, the ladies at Keepsake Needlework in, or Keepsake's Cross Stitch in Cincinnati, she had like, she uses like a Q-snap frame, like those like um, baby PPC pipey kind of things with like the, so she uses that and she has like a, they sell a tool that clamps right onto it. That is both a very bright LED light and like a small magnifier so that, she, and they're independent of each other. So you can like change you know, you can adjust it to whatever you need. Um, but I like to stitch in hand, so that wasn't necessarily something I wanted to use, but so I'm sorry if you're, if you're unable to stitch and you enjoy it. Um, that worked for me, but I understand that that's not gonna work for everybody. So let's talk about knitting, shall we? Um, I finished, I finished my Balshin or Baltian sweater. It's a pattern by Caitlin Hunter. Her, her original pattern is written for a um, superwash merino cashmere nylon. So um, for the body of the sweater and then the color work is worked in 
two strands of a mohair silk. She uses two different colors held together, uh, but you can use the same. Other folks have knit it with just the same yarn as in their body, whatever works for you. Like the same yarn type that's in their body. Uh, but here's mine. Right? Are you serious? So I'll put a picture hopefully of me wearing it in here. So let's talk to ourselves on the front porch because the neighbors don't think you're weird enough. Uh, so just an idea of like where it is on the body. This is the middle of my bee belly, so this is like my bindi waist. This is uh, the bottom of my bra line. And so one of the things I'm always nervous about on these deeper yokes is that there won't be enough uh, motion, like mobility in the arms and shoulders, like it'll make me feel like it's like this. And that's definitely not the case. Again, there is quite a bit of ease. Um, there's quite a bit of ease. <laughs> but it also doesn't feel like it, because I've used, I think, in part because I used the hair still, the wool and spun yarn, it doesn't feel like it's dragging. And of course, it's also cropped, so you're not having a ton of fabric pulling down, um, which is always, when I knit something that has a lot of positive ease, that's one of the things I'm concerned about, is that it feels like it's sagging on my body, and that this does not feel that way. Um, so, you yeah. know. And the dress I'm wearing is Merchant and Mills Esme, I think. So just an S so, yeah. Ta -da! so my version I used um, for the main body of the the main color. I used Harrisville Designs Flywheel. It's Flywheel, right? Flywheel and turbine. They have like a sport version and then like a bulkier version um, so I used that for the main color and then the contrasting color I used two skein or two two strands of Republic Unicornia Republica Unicornia in her mohair silk in the colorway electric disco clam so super fun right totally scratched my neons and neutrals itch that needed to happen um things i did differently actually i mostly did this as written um i had to go back and take apart so this is top down and you start with an i-cord cast on well my top part was wonky like I was I had there's some short rows to make the back of the yoke a little bit higher it's a boat neck right like so it's the wide um and so there's short yarn short rows to help it sit properly on the body but my short row gauge I guess was a little bit looser than my color work gauge and so it created this like bubble in the back so I just went I just took I just cut it and then un uh just unwound like unstitched because you can't just zip it back because it's from the cast on um and then redid it in a smaller needle a size two i did my color work on a size us three and i did the other part of the sweater on a us two so i took it back and then did a few a few fewer short rows and then also um then i just did an i-cord bind off so that's the only thing that's different um but yeah i think if I were going to do this pattern again for myself, I would have put more stitches in the front than the back. So as written, like almost every pattern, there are the same number of stitches on the front and on the back of the sweater. Um, but I would have put more in the front. I was hoping that with the additional ease, it would not make a difference um, so that I wouldn't have to play with that. But it's, I still think... I would have liked more ease in the front so that it looked a little bit more balanced front to back. Um, yeah. But also this is like, I'm just playing with this whole like dolman sleeve thing, which I'm not as comfortable, I'm not as used to. I did not do the additional short rows in the back um, at the bottom because the pattern is written to have like a, an asymmetrical hem. So it's a high low. So the front's a little higher than the back. But I knew since I wasn't doing anything to accommodate my larger bust, like my the more adipose tissue that's on the front of my body, I knew that it would automatically sit a little higher in the front because there needs to be more fabric to cover my breast tissue than it does in the back. Um, so I didn't work any additional short rows for the back to give it the difference. 
Um, so yeah, I would probably do the same thing again. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so this is a, this is one that I think I'm going to put up in my yard sale. If I did delete that out, because I did kind of go on a little bit of a rant at the beginning. I think we're going to have a yard sale um, December 1st, and I'll tell you more about it as we get closer. But this one might go in that sale just because I think it's going to get worn more by another human than me. And this is one where you can have like a ton of ease, um, and so it would work for somebody who's smaller than me as well. Um, but yeah, so I, I definitely love the colors together. And if I don't knit the same thing again, but just differently... Um, I'm definitely going to keep these colors together because I really dig them. The reason I was drawn to this pattern specifically is I liked that the pa that it was a little bit more graph, like it was a little bit like so many um, yoke sweaters are, are um, well, A, it's specifically used to mohair silk, which I was like, ooh. Uh, but now I'm like, I could do that with any color work, right? Like I could totally do that with any color work project. Um, but I think what I will look for is something that is graphic like this. It's like not a floral. Um, and like, for example, specifically, I was looking at some more of her patterns and so many of her yokes are gorgeous. She just released a new one, like Autumn Alpine Glow, and it's gorgeous, but it is um, a very deep yoke like this one. And so it's harder to modify that for a bigger bust um, because really kind of the only way to get your extra stitches in is to do a deeper arm scythe. Um, you can't as easily incorporate them into the color work itself. Um, so like that's a problem that I consistently have with like a deeper yoked sweater that doesn't have um, as much room to play with adding increases into it. So it's like a large, like if it's just one motif, right? So like a lot of color, um, like for example, a lot of stranded like traditional Shetland sweaters have like a smaller motif so that you could actually work extra increases in between the motifs. Um, but when it's a very large scale motif, there, there's less room to play. And yes, you could add stitches in between the repeats, but again, it's just more to play with, or more modification that I really necessarily want to make if I'm already buying a pattern. That's what I'm, I think is what I'm trying to say. Um, but so yeah, I'm definitely thinking about doing another project in the same color, in the same yarn combination, and that might be a vest. Um, I don't know, I haven't decided yet, but I think it'd be super cute to do a vest with an all over color work with this super hot pink, hot coral yarn. Um, and whether that's just like, maybe like a lice stitch or like, like an all over, or maybe like doing a smaller graphic, We'll see. I think it would also be fun to do this in a really traditional, like, fair aisle pattern repeat, uh, just to mix up like the play of the traditional and the and the modern color combination. Um, like, I think it'd be super cute to just do it all over two color, um, more traditional stranded project with that. So, yeah, I'm so I'm still in the fence of whether or not I will wear this. So it might go up for sale. Um, because it was super fun to make and I really enjoyed it. So yeah, that's that. And then I have used their worsted weight version of this yarn and I really like this. Uh, I'm speaking specifically of the Harrisville yarn. I really like this yarn. Um, I'm very pleased with how it knits up, how it blocks. And I'm very pleased with how that other sweater has worn um, over several wearings. So I think I might try to do it in the same thing. But we'll see. We'll also see if it's available. Um, so yeah. And then I have a new project. I have cast on the Academic, which is a sweater vest pattern by Skein Deer Knits. I believe hers is knit with Raum, yeah, Raum of Fenul, um, which is 100% Norwegian wool, 350 meters to 100 gam, grams. So I think Ravelry lists it as um, a sport weight. It's a little bit heavier than the Shetlands, the Jameson and Smith, but that's what I'm using. And she lists that as an alternative as well. Um, and so of course, when I was at Tuscan Rose, they had all, I was not planning on getting a project's worth of Jameson, but they had it, so I did. Uh, but I just have a wee bit knit on mine so far. 
of course it's bottom up she does four she does more um of the one by one ribbing but i kind of prefer less so i am just gonna go with that um, but yeah so there's mine so far i kind of wanted a slightly lower contrast um so i i went i tried to go with mostly medium tones but the brown is a darker one and then i also have this yellow which I do not like, but I think will work well for like the little blips of a highlighter color. Um, so this is the other color that'll be kind of just a tiny sprinkling of this, this brighter yellow. And of course I have golds if I decide that I can't handle it. <laughs> but oh, I just really enjoy stranded knitting so much. I so enjoy knitting with Jameson and Smith um, and other uh, woolen spun yarns. It's just my happy knitting place. So I'm excited about this project. Uh, the other thing I did different is that she uses just a plain one by one ribbing, but my plain one by run one ribbing often looks kind of like hot trash. Um, so what I did is I cast on my ribbing and I actually worked it on this side and I did a twisted stitch for my knits. So I did the pearls as normal, but did the twisted stitch for my knits. But I don't, I don't love the, so I don't love the look of twisted stitch ribbing sometimes, um, cause it definitely has a much more corrugated look to it. So what I did was then I just used the other side for my right side. So it just makes my one by one look a little bit more tidy, a little bit less loosey goosey. So that's a tip if you um, are doing some one by one ribbing and even scaling down your needles, it still kind of looks, ugh. Um, you can always, you could work, you could totally work the pearls as twisted stitches, but I find that more awkward. Um, so that's what I do if I'm, if I'm needing one by one. I don't want the, the, the look of twisted rib, but I do want a slightly tidier one by one rib. And I am knitting that on US 2s. I did knit the body, excuse me, I knit the ribbing on a US 1 and a half. So technically I went up a needle size, but it's very, diff it's very minimal. Um, yeah. Enjoy it so much. And I'll be honest with you, my project bag is the bag that I bought it in. <laughs> the cobbler's son has no shoes. Um, so yeah, I'll move it into a, a fancy fat scroll bag time that sometime in the future. But I mean, just FYI, like before I started making project bags, I did not have project bags. Uh, I definitely was like, I had my very first color work project that I made when I was in college, um, which was actually only my second project, I think. Sometimes it's good to know that not to know something is difficult before you do it. <laughs> so I made a colorwork vest for my grandfather and I had a basket that I bought at Pier 1 Imports, uh, which had a handle on it that was like a handle that folded down, which is such an important thing if you're knitting, right? Like if you get a knitting basket, you want that handle to be able to get out of the way. At least I do. Um, and then I had uh, napkins inside of it because it was like, not the best quality it was like not a tightly woven basket so there were lots of like wicker bits inside to catch your yarn so i just put two napkins inside of it and that was my knitting basket for that i loved it so you do not need a knitting bag to be a knitter at all there's contradictions in my life y'all <laughs> so yeah i think that is everything, right? You're like, that was too much. I understand it really was too much. It was a lot. Things are hanging in with me. <laughs> so I will see you in a few weeks. I hope until then you can enjoy, if you're in my Northern hemisphere, I hope you can enjoy some delicious apples. It is almost time for gold rush. I've been so tempted. There are orchards that are like an hour south of me that already, gold rush is my favorite apple. It is like a yellow delicious at its peak. 
So it has like the soft skin of the Yellow Delicious, but has more crunch. It has a ton of juicy goodness and it is sweet, but it is not quite as, I mean, cloying is too strong a word to use for the Golden Delicious because I have much love in my heart for Golden Delicious. That was definitely the favorite apple of my youth and like the favorite apple of, uh, if you're gonna make fried apples, do you know what those are? Have we talked about this? I don't know who I've told my stories to anymore. We've, I've done this for like 10 years. I've told you this 70 times. I'll tell you again in case you're new. Uh, one of my favorite things to eat when I was a kid, my mama would make fried apples. And really all it is is peeled apples that you cut into like a wedge. So like eighths, right? And then you just heat it in a skillet on the stovetop with a little bit of butter. Um, they're not like they're basically just like a stewed apple, but we call them fried apples. My favorite. And nobody in this house will eat them. So whenever I make them, I end up eating like four apples because they're so good. <laughs> Delicious. Um, but so the Gold Rush has like that like feel to it, but it's just a little bit more complex in its flavor. Oh, it's just and last year when I went on my sewing weekend, I found an orchard. Well, we found an orchard and they happened to have Gold Rush's U picks, which I was just like mind blown because I just had not seen them many places at all. Um, there was a small orchard in Indianapolis that has since gone. Um, I don't want to say it's gone out of business. They tried to sell it and it's just not sold yet because uh, I think it was folks retiring from that business uh, and they randomly had them. and I was super excited to get those. Um, and then there's another orchard called Tuttle Orchard that's on the east side of Indianapolis and they have them, but theirs are not ready yet. So there's an, uh, is it Huber Orchards down south? Like it's near Louisville. And then one of the orchards in Batesville, Indiana, um, there's two orchards that are in Batesville. One of them is called like Dolls. It's not that one, it's the other one, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Now I'm like, I got to look because there's like one of you, right? There's one of you who might, who might go get this apple. So like, I must uh, make all the rest of you sit through me verifying that I'm giving that one person the correct orchard information when really she is likely to just um, Google it anyway, because she needs to figure out how to get there. Okay, yeah, it's Villa Orchard. There's Dolls Orchard and Villa Orchard. I've never been to Dolls. I've only been to Villa. They are cash only, FYI. <laughs> they have Gold Rush. So now I've been like, should I drive an hour to go? It's like two hours, an hour there, an hour back to get my apples. Maybe I'll ask my mom to get me some because we're going to um, the Merry Meeting Show, which is a small but very good uh craft artisan craft show in New Harmony, Indiana, which I talked about last year. Uh, New Harmony is the site of a couple of failed utopias. One of my favorite topics. Um, and so they might have to drive there. They might have to drive through Batesville. Might have to make them stop and get me apples. Because I am a mess. And I can't wait the two weeks that it might be for the orchard in my area to get them <laughs> or for theirs to be ripe. You know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah. Hey, sorry for the abrupt ending. Um, I lost a video, a file while I was editing. So, um, but that's okay. Cause it was, it was mostly just me awkwardly trying to like reach out a hand and, and let you know that if you're having trouble humaning right now, like you're not alone, but you know that, like, you know, that unless I were like an insane, monster robot human I would be having trouble with that so basically I just want to say like you're welcome in my caracol we can uh or like maybe that's too much but like I will really happily help you build your caracol and we can like caracol down the river separately but together um so yeah I hope you can find a moment of like a like that that perfect autumn dreary almost purple sky that sometimes gives you light on yellow leaves and like I just I hope you can find a moment and then string some of those together and then I don't know
little friends, but I will see you next time.